The Syntax of Things by Arisha. Chapter 6. Wisdom. Illusions. One of the most unexpected things Harry had discovered during his stay at Spinner's End was that Snape drank. Regularly. He'd drink late at night when he'd assume Harry wasn't likely to show up and attempt a conversation with him. Reading a book or scribbling down potion recipes and other stuff he'd hide away right after, he more often than not had a glass of something near him. It was his way of relaxing, Harry had decided, and he usually respected his professor's need to forget that they were now living together. The one time Harry had gone downstairs after midnight to get a glass of water, Snape had glared at him warningly and told him to get lost. Harry was more than happy to do so, and after duly wishing him a good night, he got out of sight. Once or twice, he attempted to spy on Snape. He never caught him doing anything exciting, though, and Harry had gone to bed skeptical about his professor's life. What did the man do with his life apart from reading and writing? What did he do when he fancied to just have some fun? Then again, Harry doubted Snape had fun, ever. And when these thoughts occurred, it wasn't strange for his mind to wander back to the memories he had seen in the Pensieve. The crying, pale face in Dumbledore's office, stained with an ongoing pain that was unlike anything Harry had ever known. The affliction with which the black eyes shone, the trembling hands, the pleas for forgiveness, were all crowding together into Harry's mind, leaving him wondering for the billionth time about who Snape really was. Harry wanted to ask. He wanted to ask Snape about his past, about those memories, and most importantly, about Harry's mum. Harry had never had the chance to meet her, and learning anything at all about his parents always made his heart kick faster into his chest. He still didn't know if it would do him any good to ask Snape about them, though. Learning more about what they were like was precious, and yet what he had seen about his father in Snape's memories was not what he had imagined him to be at all. And now that Sirius was gone and couldn't defend his best friend's memory anymore, Harry was afraid of what else he might find out. What he had seen in those memories was an arrogant teenager who'd bully and humiliate a classmate for attention. As for his mother, Harry really had the impression that he would most likely regret it if he mentioned her to Snape. So Harry tried hard not to ask him anything. Instead, he always stayed in his room after dinner and let Snape have his way with sinking into his heavy books and loneliness. Sometimes Harry would roll around in his bed for hours trying to sleep or simply looking out the window checking for street cats fighting with each other as he killed flies and mosquitoes with his wand. Tonight, though, it seemed that his insomnia had finally won over, and as he was walking around the room in an attempt to ease his tension, he grew incredibly bored. Already sensing that he was making a mistake, but too proud to go back to his room, he descended and poured himself a glass of cold water from the fridge. Snape was sunk into his armchair in the living room, reading a book. Silently, Harry chose a random book from a shelf, too, and sat on the sofa. The front cover said, The Encyclopedia of Bat Eyes. Harry sighed disappointedly. Well, it wasn't the best of choices, but then again, Snape wasn't likely to have any comic books nearby. What do you think you're doing now? Snape had drawn his eyes from his book and was now prying on Harry intently. Harry shrugged. I can't sleep. I won't bother you, promise. Snape seemed to consider it. Very well. They both returned to their books, but Harry didn't find anything interesting to read himself. It was a potions record, as it turned out, and a very boring one, too. He tried to make himself grow sleepy over it, but failed miserably. He counted the letters of the words and the paragraphs of each page. Then he browsed it from beginning to end and from end to beginning. His fingers brushed his scar as he rubbed his forehead, and he wondered if Snape's dark mark was making him feel as miserable as Harry's scar did most of the time. Harry looked up at him, Snape's face barely illuminated by the dim light of some candles and an old lamp behind him. His lips were pressed into a thin line and his eyes were focused on his text. Whatever he was reading was surely far more interesting than bat eyes. I don't understand Dumbledore, Harry admitted bitterly, his voice barely above a whisper. He didn't mean to speak, the words came out on their own. He didn't even ask me if I want to be here. Snape glared back at him, and his face was a blank mask. Only a bigoted fool would question Dumbledore's intentions, he said. Of course, what could one expect from a potter? You take pleasure from a divine your superiors, there is no doubt. Harry scrunched his face. He's been wrong before, about people. He could be wrong about you, too. Have you told Voldemort I'm here? 
Snape turned to Paige and his lip curked slightly. Don't tempt me, Potter. Harry snorted. He turned to Paige, too, to give the impression that he had comprehended his reading, too. He couldn't talk with Snape about his parents, but there was certainly another matter that was demanding to be discussed. Why did Dumbledore lie to me? I mean, about the prophecy and everything. All these years, I deserved to know. I was relying on him to tell me everything he knew. He didn't expect an honest answer from Snape, but he had to try. Snape arched his eyebrows to his book, as though he was appreciating a private joke. A very unwise decision of yours, although we've all been there. Yeah, right, he's never going to trust me as much as he'd trust you. If I'd known about the prophecy, Sirius would be alive. I'd live with him instead of you. I'd have a family. I'm not a child. I know you think I am, but I'm not. I can fight Voldemort. Harry waited for a reaction to that, too curious to look away. What he got was only a peering gaze. The headmaster shares a surprising amount of information with you. An unnecessary risk, if you ask me. If I were head of the Order, you wouldn't even know its existence. Feel flattered. Snape took his empty glass from the table and filled it again with fire whiskey. He turned another page. Harry didn't think that Snape was actually reading either. Flattered, said Harry indignantly. Do you even read the papers? They call me the next Dark Lord. They say I'm building an army to, to rule over England or something. Last year, half the school thought I was paranoid for saying Voldemort's back, and the other half thought I'd killed Cedric. No one trusts me. No one takes me seriously. Not even you or Dumbledore. Especially you and Dumbledore. He trailed off. I thought you said you wouldn't bother me. Snape warmed without looking up, which only fueled the fire that burned inside Harry's heart. Dumbledore is wrong about you. He wanted to say, but his throat clenched around it as he realized how childish it would sound. Dumbledore had been wrong in the past multiple times about many people. Yeah, well, and I thought I'd never have to live with a Death Eater, but here I am. Harry tried to bite back his malice, but it slipped out along with his words. I'll have to face Voldemort at some point, and I will. I won't surrender or run away. I'm ready for it. Either you think I'm stupid or not. You tell him that, he added inwardly. Let's hope you'll be able to tell the difference between a hero and a foolish martyr by then at least. I don't say his name. I don't consider myself a hero. Harry responded defensively. I won't consider myself a hero, even when I'll have already killed him, because I will kill him. The Dark Lord has skills you have not. The words were slowly spitted out with a drawl. The Headmaster overestimates your abilities. He tends to forget what such weakness could do. His faith in the greater good is far beyond me, and I insist on believing that he should have never used it on a teenage boy. Your sentiment surpassed your common sense this year, but it was to be expected. Harry felt his heart skip a beat. He certainly wasn't hurt for being called a teenager, especially by Snape, who'd called him much worse things in the past. He thought of many possible retorts, but all of them involved Sirius, and Harry had already decided that he'd have to avoid subjects like this if he were to survive living with Snape. Reminding him how hateful Snape was wasn't going to do any good. I don't think I'm Dumbledore's final plan anyway. Maybe you are. You know much more than I do, and you're closer to him than I am. Have you thought about it? Maybe I'm the cover or something. Not that he'd tell me. The more one knows about Albus Dumbledore's plans, the more in danger one is. Let alone in despair. The responsibility is too heavy for your shoulders. Don't ask for more than he already gives you. You might regret it. Harry Chango. So if you really know that much, where is he now? Because I know he's not at Hogwarts. Mental images of the old wizard wearing a swimsuit paraded inside his mind, and he blinked them away in dread. Snape closed his book, defeated. He tossed it on the table and rested his head back on the cushions, sliding a bit lower in his seat. He stretched his legs and raised a hand to cover his closed eyes. He's on an adventure, as he chooses to call it. What he really does, if you ask me, is risking too much based on theories rather than evidential facts. He let his hand fall on the armrest. Leaning forward, he took another sip of his forgotten drink and savored it before swallowing. Wasting energy and being exposed like that during the Ministry's worst period of provocation is unthinkable. And yet he tries with all his might to be removed from Hogwarts once and for good. Just wait and see. Harry wondered if Snape had let too much slip out accidentally, judging by the way Snape was eyeing his glass reprovingly, he supposed he had. 
If Dumbledore is searching for something that might help us defeat Voldemort, then I want to join him, Harry said. Snape rolled his eyes. Of course you do. By all means, Potter, do go and join him. How gallant you two must be, solving riddles together in the wild. And for the last time, don't speak the Dark Lord's name. Snape sighed. Superhuman Dumbledore, superhuman Potter. Harry bit back a chuckle. Um, sir, I think you're drunk. Mind your business. Snape snapped. What do you mean by riddles? Nothing of your concern. So, he's looking for something specific. I mean, like a weapon. Like the prophecy. Snape was sullen. Your mind was recently attacked to the point where you could hardly tell the difference between visions and reality. What makes you think it wouldn't be a fatal mistake for anyone to entrust you with anything? Harry couldn't help but feel underprivileged and his temper overwhelmed him. You still kneel before Voldemort's feet and yet you know more than I do. If you ever become an Occlumens, we might have this conversation again. And don't say his name. Harry was tired of hearing that. No matter how uncomfortable it made others, he wasn't going to be part of the hypocrisy. Why not? I'm not afraid of him. I won't be afraid of his name. There are worse things than fear. Things I doubt you could ever stand to even witness. Every name bears a past. And I would prefer to spare myself the memories the particular name brings along. Especially when used irresponsibly by someone who does not know what he's talking about. The last part was spat with a little more venom, Harry noticed. I'm sorry, he thought of saying, but it was a surrender he didn't feel like offering. Maybe he indeed didn't know what he was talking about. Perhaps Snape had seen some really awful things in his life, and he had connected Voldemort's name with experiences he'd rather forget. Fearing his name is like giving him power. Harry pressed. You have to grow up, Potter. This is bigger than you. Snape sounded grim. Harry didn't feel like a child. He didn't know what growing up meant to Snape, but Harry had already lost too much to be considered a child. He had to prove this somehow, but words didn't seem to work in such matters. And then again, he shouldn't care about Snape's opinion anyway. Harry stretched out his legs too and felt the goosebumps run down his toes. He pulled his feet up on the sofa and sat cross-legged, ready to respond, when he looked up to find Snape staring back dangerously. Feeling cozy, Potter, he sneered. Yes, quite. Thanks, answered Harry. You insolent brat, get your feet off my sofa this instant. Oh, Harry curled his toes as though to make a point of his sex. What, I'm not wearing shoes. Snape glared hard before closing his eyes again. Harry had left his wand upstairs and his hands felt empty, as though they didn't know what to do with themselves. Sighing, he picked up Snape's book from the table. A Midsummer Night's Dream was the title. He opened it and read a few lines. What's this? Poetry? (laughs) Snape didn't open his eyes. Harry chuckled. You can't scowl when you're sleepy, Professor. Sorry. He found a random excerpt and read it aloud. Thus I die. Thus, thus, thus. Now I am dead. Now I am fled. My soul is in the sky. Tongue lose thy light. Moon take thy flight. Now die, 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 die. God, Snape, you're a creep. Manners, Potter. What's the story about? Mm. The book, what's it about? Illusions. Harry looked up from the text, only to see that Snape had slid even lower to the chair. Harry cleared his throat. Snape, I think you're sleeping. I'm not. Harry didn't know what to do with the sleepy Snape. He'd seen him angry, deranged, bitter, shouting. He'd seen him throw him out of his class, insult him, grab his arms, and push him away with wrath. He'd also seen him hold on his temper, eyes dangerously shining before a hurtful comment was spitted out, or before he simply walked away. He'd never seen him sleepy, though. It seemed like crossing a very thin line. Like knowing things he wasn't supposed to know. He couldn't bring himself to explain how Snape being human was one of them. Still, the uneasiness made him stare awkwardly at his professor, not knowing what to make of the image before him. It hadn't been so difficult to come to terms with Remus outside school. Even though he was a werewolf and could have proven himself much more dangerous than Snape, Harry would spend massive amounts of time with him at Grimald Place without ever being perplexed. Now, Sleepy Remus was a picture his mind could comprehend. Sleepy Snape wasn't. It was the authority, Harry decided. His attitude was making it impossible for other people to think of him as a normal person. And the sneer. Definitely the sneer. What are you gawking at? murmured Snape. Harry blinked. Uh, nothing. You were... 
Never mind, I think I should go to bed now. Good night, sir. When he didn't get a response, he ran. <laughs>